If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, this will be our second week here away from the book of Genesis, but continuing our little break and excursus into a different passage, into a New Testament book. But this is, I trust, helping you understand the need to have a healthy heart, a heart that is right with God, and a heart, as we're going to see today, that is able to share Him, serve others. You might remember last week, our opening illustration had to do with a cup of coffee and whether drinking coffee was beneficial physically for your heart. Well, what the verdict might, the jury might be out on that, but it is a pretty well established fact that coffee is a great tool for socializing. If you go into a coffee shop, they, they've got, I mean, most of the, the places around here these days, it's like walking into somebody's living room. They have it set up with fireplaces and couches and places where you can go and converse and talk. When I was serving back at Brown Street Baptist in Alton, Illinois, uh, my associate pastor, Eric Lloyd, he, he would go with me to some of these places, but he was not a coffee drinker. Uh, he would go and get a bottle of orange juice or something. It's like, how, how can you bypass all, all this wonderful stuff? Like, not, not, not for me, not for me. But coffee has had a long history of being a social drink. This is from the Institute for Scientific Information on Coffee. And yes, there is an Institute for Scientific Information on Coffee. They say coffee was first cultivated and traded in Arabia. By the 15th century, coffee was being grown in the Yemeni district of Arabia, and by the 16th century, it was known in Persia, Egypt, Syria, and Turkey. During this time, public coffee houses were particularly popular in the Middle East, where people could listen to music, watch performers, play chess, and discuss the news of the day over a cup of coffee. They became such an important center for the exchange of information that the coffee houses were often referred to as schools of the wise. In the 17th century, coffee appeared in Europe. The first European coffee house was sold, uh, first European coffee was sold in pharmacies as a medicinal remedy. However, coffee houses were soon established and quickly became popular. The first European coffee house opened in Venice in 1683. Historically, coffee houses have been an important social gathering point in Europe and their appearance encouraged several cultural and political transformations during the 17th and 18th centuries. They provided a forum for exchanging views and nurturing public opinion across the social spectrum. Furthermore, the coffee houses were popular with natural philosophers, antiquarians, and historians as places for like-minded scholars to congregate, read, learn from, and debate with each other. Coffee houses were, and continue to be, venues where people gather to talk, read, write, entertain one another, or pass the time. Some research suggests that we use lighthearted conversation to establish and maintain our connection within a group, as well as for mere information transfer. So, by providing a space for regular but unplanned interaction with members of the community, coffee houses may play a role in creating social networks, and therefore, encouraging community values. Now, there's more that we could say about that, but, you know, speaking more from observation, it is, I don't go to coffee houses maybe as much as I would like to. You just can't really afford to, but I, I brew my own. <laughs> but when I do, it's usually not just to indulge my taste buds. It's usually to connect, maybe even with one of you, over a cup of coffee to have a conversation. I think one of the last people I met at, at a Caribou Coffee was Ben Cockrum, and we sat and discussed uh, some different things regarding uh, the ministry here. It was a blessing to be able to do so. The, the, what you're drinking is, is, is wonderful, but it is what's being shared that is more frequent. It's also been my observation that when you're going there, whether I'm doing it or I'm looking across the room, it's not unusual to see someone sitting there with a Bible open, uh, getting the chance to talk and to ground themselves in, explain the truth of God's Word. 
So in that way, whether coffee is physically good for our heart or not, it is good for us to perhaps think through what are we gaining in spiritual development with a cup of coffee. (laughs) As you think through that, let's think through again, what is it last time that we were together, we learned that needy people know how to get their blessings from God. They, They need to be blessed by God. They know where to look to find their joy, to find their satisfaction. This morning, as we continue to work our way through the second half of the Beatitudes, we'll read all of them together uh, in Matthew chapter 5. But as we think through those verses, I want us to see more importantly this morning how we can understand how needy people, after they have gotten their needs satisfied by God, are also in a position to know how to bless other people. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 3. Let's read through those verses together. The words are also on your screen if you'd like to follow along there as I read from the English Standard Version. Matthew writes, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Matthew, of course, is writing. Jesus is speaking. And Jesus says, Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. And here's where we begin our focus this morning. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. This is the word of God inerrant, infallible, inspired, written by God and written for us that we might know what to believe, that we might know how to live, that on its pages we might meet the living Christ. May God add his blessing here to the reading of his word this morning. I saw a statement that was actually just reported this morning for the first time I saw it as I was getting ready to speak to you this morning. A well-known speaker here in the United States has come out with yet another controversial statement. He has said that it only take it is only necessary for a Christian to believe in two miracles in order to legitimately be called a Christian. As you think through what he's saying, the speaker says there's one, the miracle of creation, and two, the miracle of the resurrection. All the other things can kind of be up for debate. You can question, you can struggle with doubts, but those two are absolutely necessary in order to be known as a Christian, in order to buy in to what Christianity presents and makes claims to. Well, I wouldn't want to say that you shouldn't believe in creation. I wouldn't want to say you shouldn't believe in the resurrection. But I would also want to say that if we can't believe in something like the virgin birth of Christ, if we can't believe that a God could part the waters of the Red Sea or destroy the entire world by a flood, or that he could give sight to the blind, Jesus could raise the dead, those things, as fantastical as they are, are real are true. But if we can't believe in those things, why would we ever believe that the poor in spirit are going to inherit the kingdom of heaven? That those who mourn would be comforted? How are we going to understand and have confidence in a God who can not just part the waters of the Red Sea, but who can change my life, can change my priorities? Friends, What I'm here to remind you of this morning are practical choices that make a difference in our life. But Jesus is giving these principles to his Jewish audience to remind them that this is why they need him. This is why Jesus has come, because this is not something that they're able to live up to on their own. They need changed hearts. And friends, that is the same for us today. In order for us to resemble anything close 
to what Jesus lays out here is not going to be able to be done on any of our own personal choice alone. It will take the transformative work of God's Holy Spirit in your life to enable us to live in a way that looks like Jesus Christ, that looks like the expectations that He puts out for us here in this list. And God, understanding what our needs are, will, as you see on the outline on the back of your worship guide this morning, satisfy our desires. God satisfies our desires. And so we are picking up, last week we looked at the first four of the Beatitudes, beginning in verse 3 and down through verse 6. Today we begin our focus in verse 7. God satisfies our desires because blessed are the merciful, they will receive mercy. This reminds us that God looks at the undeserving and rewards them. The undeserving are rewarded. You might remember last week, as we went through this uh, section of Scripture, one of the ways that we showed how you can understand what it means, what Jesus is talking about, is to see these principles embodied in the life of David. And so, as we look on the next point of the outline, the undeserving are rewarded. We look at the example of King David that is in 1 Samuel. David meets a man by the name of Nabal in 1 Samuel chapter 25. Nabal has a beautiful wife named Abigail. Nabal is very, maybe we could say, arrogant. He is hostile. He knows who David is, but he doesn't do anything to go out of his way to be hospitable to somebody he knows is on the run. He is a difficult, obstinate individual. And David, when he is met with this kind of behavior, actually gets very angry. And it records in verse 21, and one of the reasons he's very angry, as you'll see, is David says, I've been watching this guy's shepherds. I've been watching his herds, making sure that the people who are attacking them, I'm providing security uh, so he can sustain his life. And he just wanted a little bit of hospitality in return. He needed some uh, sustenance. He needed some uh, feedback, I guess, if you will. He, he, He needed, I'm scratching your back. Could you scratch a little bit of mine? But Nabal refused. And so this is David's reaction to him in 1 Samuel 25, 21. Now David had said, Surely in vain have I guarded all this fellow has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that belonged to him. And he has returned me evil for good. God do so to the enemies of David and more also, if by morning I leave so much as one male of all who belong to him. So David feels like I can return back evil for evil. This guy has mistreated me. He has refused to help me after all I've done for him. And so he feels justified. He feels like this is the appropriate thing to do. But Nabal's wife, Abigail, advocates for her husband. She comes and pleads for mercy. David, as you scan through the passage, gives that to her. He is moved by her plea, but he is also, because he is, as we have seen before, a man after God's heart. This is how God describes him. He is moved because he knows that what she is asking for is right. We don't return evil for evil if we are followers of God, because that's not how God treats us. God says that we are supposed to overcome evil with good. But this reminds us that even in David's life, overcoming evil with good is often not our first instinct. We want to indulge in revenge. We want to give people the payback. If they go after our political candidate, we're going to go after them twice as hard. That kind of a thing. We have a hunger and a thirst to be right and then to put the other person in their place. But these obstacles are really obstacles to being more like Jesus, behaving 
like he would want us to. How has God treated us? Again, this is how David himself puts it in Psalm 103, beginning in verse 10. David says about God, He does not deal with us according to our sins, nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is His steadfast love, says the ESV, His mercy toward those who fear Him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does He remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear Him. So, that means that we all who know Jesus Christ have benefited from this compassion, from this mercy, this steadfast, unfailing love that God shows to us. In that while we were still sinners, how does God show it? Christ died for us. And maybe, friend, you don't know exactly what we're talking about here this morning. You're still a little bit skeptical about the miracles. You're skeptical about this whole Christianity thing. Understand this, that God knows who we are. God knows what we have done. God says the wages of sin is death. God cast out Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden, out of the perfect paradise that he had made for them for transgressing one simple rule. They ate of the fruit of which he commanded they should not eat. And all of us were cast out. As human beings, as Adam's descendants, we deserve death for who we are and what we've done. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But understand this, Christian, that kind of mercy that God shows towards us is the kind of mercy that he expects us to incorporate into our lives to define us as his followers. For example, Proverbs 31, we all know Proverbs 31, that's a passage we often cite on Mother's Day, that that alphabetical list of those, those people, the, the, the character qualities that a, a woman should, who fears the Lord has, the virtuous woman. Well, in the introduction to that chapter, this is not part of the virtuous woman list. This is King Lemuel. And King Lemuel says that one of the things that should mark a faithful follower of God is somebody who does this in verse 8. Open your mouth for the mute, for the rights of all who are destitute. Open your mouth, judge righteously, defend the rights of the poor and needy. I said, Pastor, that doesn't fit my, my party's platform. No, but it fits God's. This is what we are called to do. To do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God, Micah 6, 8. And that Christian whether it's a matter of government policy, should be a matter of Christian policy, of Christian compassion. God calls us to advocate for others. God calls us to serve. Jesus says, He who is the greatest among you, let him occupy a prominent position and, and, and hold an office and, and wield his authority. No, says, He is the greatest among you, let him be your servant. And yes, we have to be wise. Yes, we have to be judicious. But yes, we also have to maintain a priority of living lives that benefit others around us. There is no better way that we can do that as Christians than giving the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. But if we are wanting people to have an audience for the gospel of Jesus Christ, James says we cannot shut our compassion off. We cannot say to the hungry man, be warmed and filled and not care for his physical needs and expect him to hear us when we give him the truth of the gospel. We have to have mercy. If we fulfill, James says, the royal law according to Scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. God has that expectation for the Christian community. Showing mercy. The undeserving are the ones who are 
rewarded. Not because they've earned it, but because they are in need. Just like we all are. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 7 says, Blessed are the merciful, they shall obtain mercy. Verse 8 says, Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We've talked about in quite a bit of detail last week about David and his sin with Bathsheba, his murder of Uriah. And in that prayer, in the psalm that he composes to make the confession in Psalm 51, he says in verse 10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. His previous actions had shown his deceit, had put on display his deviancy, his destitution, his corruption, his depravity. It was on full display for all the world to see. But he had to confront that. He had to ask God to change his heart. And this is something that all of us need to do as well. Whether you're coming to Christ for the first time or whether you as a Christian are too confident in your self-sufficiency, in your moral righteousness, and not realizing that it's God who has to continue to change our hearts, to help us grow in Christ-likeness. This is what John says in his epistle in 1 John 3, 3. Everyone who thus hopes in Christ keeps the process going. He purifies himself as he is pure. That is, he recognizes there's never a point in time where you can just rest and say, I've got this all figured out. It's a constant process. If you don't confess your sin, sin is going to take over. Sin is going to dominate. Whether it's the same sin or not is not the issue. We can maybe have victory over here over a habitual sin of greed or lust or lying or things. But if we put all those things aside, we can also get over here and get bogged down with a sin of arrogance and pride and self-sufficiency, failing to show other people mercy, failing to make others a priority, getting too confident in who we are, getting too comfortable with where we are. God calls us to a different life, a life of constant growth, of constant purification, to resemble Jesus more. Again, James says in James 4, 8, draw near to God and He will draw near to you. So then, He calls us to activity, to continue to cleanse your hands and purify your hearts. Peter says it this way in 1 Peter 1, 22, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love love one another earnestly and how do you love it says from a pure heart since you have been born again not of perishable seed but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of god for all flesh is grass and all its glory like the flower of the grass you can look outside and see this verse vividly depicted in your vision the grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord remains forever. Peter says, and this word is the good news that was preached to you. What is the good news? It's ultimately that, yes, you're a sinner, but Jesus died to save you from it. It's not that you're good enough. You weren't good enough. Jesus died so that you might live. And friend, the gospel hasn't changed. It's not a matter of you pray the prayer, now you're in the club. It's a matter of constant mortification, constant purification. Because you, until Christ comes and takes us home to glory, where we will be like him, for we will see him as he is, we continue to struggle. We continue to wrestle with the reality of sin in our lives. Let not sin reign in your mortal bodies, Paul says in Romans, because it's a reality. It's a constant threat. We must crucify the deeds of our flesh and our mind. And we must do so daily. Pure in heart will see God. Blessed, verse 9, are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. 
A true peacemaker must put others' interests before their own. David does this in quite a vivid and difficult way in 2 Samuel chapter 21. In that verse, in that passage, it's not one of the well-known stories about David's life, but in that passage, a famine has come upon Israel, and God reveals that it is because of an unresolved injustice that was committed by his predecessor, King Saul, against the Gibeonites. The Gibeonites were a people that had really kind of manipulated their way into a good relationship with Israel because if you might remember back in the book of Joshua, they're the ones who made themselves look like they were from far away. They got the old wineskins and they, they made themselves look like they had traveled from a distance. But really they were Canaanite people. They were people that God had commanded Joshua and Israel to destroy. But Joshua was deceived and made a treaty with them to spare their lives. After that, then he figures out, wait a minute, I messed up. But because he had made a vow, that was more important. That took precedence over the command. And he was, if, if he had broken that precedence, if he had broken the covenant that he had made with them, he would be putting God's people into further disrepute. And so they had made a covenant to protect the Gibeonites, to look out for their safety. When Saul was put in as the monarch over Israel, he understood that there were still things that needed to be done to give Israel its prominence and dominance in the land that God had given. And so he was doing his best to eradicate the Philistines. And do, to, uh, you might remember the whole thing with the Amalekites, and he makes the improper sacrifice and, and everything that's going on there. Well, in the process of doing that, he also goes after the Gibeonites, and he breaks the covenant that Joshua had made all the way back hundreds of years before. Saul was guilty of breaking the covenant. He was guilty for acts, we might say, we might describe it today as genocide against the Gibeonite people. But when David sees that God is punishing the nation, holding a famine over them, he seeks out and asks God, and God tells him this is why. So he goes to the Gibeonites and asks how justice can be served. How can we make this situation right? The Gibeonites ask for seven of Saul's descendants to be executed. Seems rather harsh. David agrees to it. Now, we would say maybe that's in keeping, their request is in keeping with what Moses lays out in the law in Exodus 21, in verse 23, if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. But it also says in this passage that it's not just Saul that did this. In fact, Saul couldn't commit an act like that on his own. It says in 2 Samuel 21.1, that this is not only because of Saul's actions, but one translation renders it Saul's bloody family. They were complicit in this. They were participating in this activity. The famine has come, the New Living Translation says, because Saul and his family are guilty of murdering the Gibeonites. David makes it right. David goes through with the execution. And God lifts the famine off of the land. David's actions in this difficult situation show us that making and keeping peace is not always an easy thing to do. It can sometimes be quite complicated, as a matter of fact. But it also shows us that God was pleased and honored by his actions. Because as you see at the end of chapter 21, the drought is ended. The famine is lifted. God returns his favor on the nation. Why? Now, now, how are we going to learn from that? You say, Pastor, I'm not really in a, a position where I have that kind of decision to make. I don't have that kind of influence. I'm not a government official. I'm not a negotiation kind of a person like David was. But sometimes, friends, we do need wisdom in making decisions. We need to make the priority, even sometimes in complicated situations. Many of you were here last Sunday night. And you know what we have to go through as a congregation. You know some of the decisions that we have had to wrestle with here at Calvary. 
And none of us relished that, but we prayed for wisdom, and God gave it to us. And I, I would also say that coming out of that meeting, we had a sense of connection. We had a sense of unity as we believed and obeyed the truth. But I think at the same time, you could also see that we have made it a priority to keep this relationship with the people who are involved in that situation. That's an important thing too. Not just to cast them aside carelessly as the offender who is deserving of punishment, whose guilt ostracizes them from the community. We have sought, and I would say not maybe always successfully, but not through lack of effort, to keep and maintain the peace that God wants us to. This is what Paul says to the Ephesians in Ephesians chapter 4. I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, that's an important phrase for us to focus on. It's the unity of the Spirit that He's already given to us, but it's ours to make sure we maintain. When there is conflict, it's not us, uh, or it's not God who is bringing in the conflict, it's us who is allowing our differences to bring in disputes, to bring in harshness. God's given us a spirit of unity. God's given us peace. And we need to maintain it. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Verse 10, Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. The restless in God can find their peace. God gives us strength to endure. To endure the difficulties. To endure the resistance that we will certainly encounter. I would encourage you for David's example here in this final point to turn to Matthew or to Psalm chapter 59, the 59th Psalm. As you see in the header, this is written when Saul is fleeing for his life. It says when Saul sent men to watch his house in order to kill him. If you want to see the historical context, you can look in 1 Samuel chapter 19 and verse 11. But in Psalm 59, you kind of see what's going on in David's mind and in what he's thinking when his life is under threat. They pursue him, it says in the third verse of Psalm 59, for no transgression or sin of mine. But this is what it says. Deliver me, David says, from my enemies, O my God. Protect me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from those who work evil and save me from bloodthirsty men. For behold, they lie in wait for my life. Fierce men stir up strife against me. For no transgression or sin of mine, O Lord, for no fault of mine they run and make ready. Awake, come to meet me and see. You, Lord God of hosts, are God of Israel. Rouse yourself to punish all the nations. Spare none of those who treacherously plot evil. Each evening they come back howling like dogs and prowling about the city. There they are, bellowing with their mouths, with swords in their lips. For who they think, will hear us. But focus on verse 8. But you, O Lord, laugh at them. You hold all the nations in derision. So David says, My strength, I will watch for you. For you, O God, are my fortress. My God, in His steadfast love, my God, in His mercy, will meet me. God will let me look in triumph on my enemies. Kill them not, lest my people forget Make them totter by your power and bring them down, O Lord, our shield. That is, we could keep reading there, but here's what I want you to emphasize. Here's what I want you to learn from that. David's confidence is not in revenge, is not in avenging himself. He leaves it to God. He leaves it to the one who is sovereign and in control of everything. These people are seeking literally to destroy him, to assassinate him. And yet, he, does, he has, though we've seen it time and again, the opportunity to take these things into his own hands. He rests in God. 
he finds strength to endure. So that last verse of the psalm says, O my strength, I will sing praises to you, for you, O God, are my fortress. You are the God who shows me mercy. You are the God who shows me steadfast love. So we, friends, must look to God's truth and see how are we responding. I would challenge you, like we did last week, to analyze your heart. Oftentimes, I would say, as we look at society, we can find that our hearts are cynical and skeptical. The Christian knows that God sees people who need mercy. But if we're being honest, that's not how we often see our neighbors. We see them as our opponents. We see them as dirty. We see them as causing trouble. We see them as people who are risks, who are presenting us as safety issues. There's, there's times where we might need to be wise. But we should never let wisdom trump our compassion for our neighbors. Do we see them as sinners who are in need of compassion or opponents to be bested? We must be careful not to let ideas blind us to the fact that people have a soul and that without Christ, they are doomed to a Christless eternity in hell. Blessed are the merciful. They will receive mercy. We must have that kind of compassion. Are we the kind of people as you look to the next point in your outline, God satisfies our desires, so we are analyzing our heart. We are seeing that our hearts can be cynical and skeptical. Next, we'll see that our hearts can sometimes be easily distracted. And here, the idea is the pure in heart is not just a purity free from sin, but a heart that can be focused, that needs to be focused on God. And the society that we live in offers so many diversions. And those diversions really can take our minds and our focus off of who they need to be on and how we need to be living. The pure in heart have that undivided attention, that focus on Jesus. This is how Solomon puts it in Proverbs 4, verse 25. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet. Then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. That is, be disciplined. Be focused with the direction of your heart. And here we will see that Jesus, as he rebukes Martha in Luke chapter 10, What does he rebuke her for? You are anxious and troubled about many things, but one thing is necessary. And he compares her to her sister Mary. And Mary says she's made the right choice. She's chosen the good portion, and that will not be taken away. There's a time to serve. There's a time to learn. There's a time to listen. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7.35, that we must secure our undivided attention. And where does that focus? That focuses on the Lord. Finally, as we bring this to a close, our analyzing our hearts, we're easily distracted. We can be dominated by fear. But fear must not be allowed to take precedence over faith. The alternative these days to being a peacemaker is to give in to panic. Clamor and conflict rule the day, motivated by fears of the unknown, fears of what might be, maybe here in this election season, if the other side wins, what's going to happen to our country? But we cannot allow ourselves to give in to panic. Again, David says in Psalm 56, when I am afraid, God, I put my trust in you. In God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can flesh do to me? That's not to say that the ideas don't matter. That's not to say we shouldn't devote ourselves to where we can, making a difference, whether it be in policy or in practice. But you know what? If the other side wins, 
and those policies don't go the way that we want them to, friend, that shouldn't change your practice. It shouldn't change your commitment to live in uprightness, to live in following God, to live with compassion to others. Deuteronomy 31.6 Be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them, for it is the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Friend, what's your purpose? Is it to be right or is it to live right? Blessed are those who persecute or are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When we find that strength to endure in Jesus Christ, when God satisfies our desires, then we can know how we can be a blessing to others. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. When God has satisfied our need, needy people will know how to bless others. And that's the conclusion that I want you to remember as you leave this morning. Know that being a person more like Jesus Christ, conforming to His image, that is what's going to make you able to show mercy, able to show compassion. We're going to conclude just a moment singing the song, Only a Holy God. And God is a powerful God. God is a God of miracles. But God also, as you're going to see in that third verse, is the one who could rescue us from our failings. The one who offered His only Son. The one who invites us to call Him Father. We who were His enemies can now not just be His friends, we can be His family. That's who we're supposed to emulate. That's who we're supposed to put on display to the world around us. Friends, be a merciful person. Be a compassionate person. Be a peacemaker. Because that's how people will see God in our lives. And that's how ultimately you will see God. By living the life that He wants you to live. That He's empowered you to do because He's given you a new heart. We thank You, Father, for giving us these promises, giving us these expectations, but then giving us the power to live this way through Your Spirit, through the One who transforms our wicked, evil hearts into ones that can love you and by loving you, show our love to others. We pray, Lord, that you will help us to follow this mission that you've given to us, to show compassion and proclaim your truth to the world around us so men and women, boys and girls, might be saved. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.